My guest on this week's episode of Suds and Search is Eric Enga, Principal at Perficient. Eric is one of the most recognizable faces in digital marketing. He is a frequent keynote speaker, a prolific writer, blogger, researcher, teacher, and entrepreneur. Eric has won numerous awards. In 2018, he was named the Search Personality of the Year by the Drum Search Awards. In 16, he was awarded Search Engine Land's Landy Award for Search Marketer of the Year. And he also won the U.S. Search Awards Search Personality of the Year in 2016. Eric is the lead author of the book, The Art of SEO, a 900 plus page book that is frequently used as the textbook for learning SEO. Eric started Stone Temple Consulting in 1997 and grew it to be one of the most celebrated brands in SEO. In 2018, Proficient acquired Stone Temple Consulting. Under Eric's leadership, the accolades have continued to pour in including the 2019 Interactive Marketing Award for Best SEO Agency and Best Interactive Marketing Agency for Proficient. He has written for nearly every major search publication I can think of, including Search Engine Land, Search Engine Journal, Moz, Copyblogger, and many others. I'm going to ask Eric about a link building study his team has been publishing annually in partnership with Moz. Eric also started the popular video series Here's Why. Our mutual friend, Mark Traphagen, was a co-host of the show for years. Eric recently brought Mark back on. I'm going to ask him a few questions about that episode, which was about the power of user intent. Grab something cold to drink and join me for a conversation with the inimitable Eric Enga. We'll talk about why studying the past in digital marketing is so important, how to optimize for featured snippets, and why you shouldn't over-focus on snippets. Plus, we'll talk a little bit about foosball and wine tennis. Eric Enga, welcome to Sus and Search. How you doing? I'm doing great, Mark. How are you? I'm doing great. This is a big get for us. I'm really excited to have you on. And it's good timing. I just talked last week to your former colleague and frequent collaborator, Mark Traphagen. I I'm asked sorry, him. I, I don't recognize <laughs> the name. Well, you don't what? recognize him yet? No. And I asked him literally last week, I said, would you and Eric ever film an episode of Here's Why Again? And he said, you're going to like, you're not going to believe this, but we're about to release one that, as far as I can tell, just got released yesterday, if I'm not mistaken, a, a, a video of this. Um, for years, I have a video series I was inspired by Here's Why. The, the stuff that you and Mark would do was awesome. It was, you, you learned a lot, and it was funny, and it was creative, and you guys would dress up like gladiators one week, and you had great costumes. Uh, what was it like getting back in, into filming with, with Mark again? Oh, well, it's just... It's a great experience. I mean, Mark is such a likable, likable by, guy, very personable, smart. Uh, we've just got a good rhythm for, uh, um, you know, talking together and kind of a, you can see the, the natural back and forth that happens. Uh, um, and, you know, frankly, while we do script to a degree what goes on, you know, a lot of it just, just spontaneous and, um, uh, so it's just great to be able to have that kind of rhythm in creating content with someone. And, and I think it helps make the content that much more absorbable. Yeah. And you guys do have great, great chemistry, but the, the videos always have a lot of actionable uh, advice, good content for SEOs. Uh, this one was no exception. So you guys were talking about the power of user intent. You had, right. uh, you had several suggestions for why this was important. One of your recommendations in the video was to think beyond high value keywords. This is advice I would like to give to my clients because they always care about the high value keywords. Can you tell, uh, can you tell our audience why they should think beyond high value keywords? Why there's more, more meat on the bone than they might think? Well, I, I'm going to give you a fun answer to start. The reason why okay. you need to think beyond high value keywords is because you want to rank for high value keywords. <laughs> How is that for an answer? That's a good answer. I like it. Yes. So it, it, this is actually a really complex topic, but a great one, Mark. And I'm glad you brought it up because um, the whole thing around how Google views what they're trying to do with their product, the search engine product in particular, or service, I should say, um, is that they're trying to create an ecosystem where users can quickly and rapidly get what they want. Because ultimately, when someone goes to Google, what they're there for is to get something fast. They're mm -hmm. not going there to be entertained or spend a lot of time hanging around. And this is true whether the user gets kept on Google platform and satisfied by something there or pushed off. It's still about getting something fast, right? And mm -hmm. so for Google to maintain and grow its market share even, 
uh, and even increased the amount of revenue they get per visitor. It's all about driving very, very high levels of user satisfaction. Um, by the way, you asked a question that has kind of a long answer to it. Uh, my <laughs> apologies. <laughs> I, 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 it's, that's, that's usually what I do. I'm sorry, Eric. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's all good. So um, in any case, for them, they want those one, top one, two, three results. They want the user to be able to get what they're looking for right there, right? Ideally, number one, but certainly within the top three, three answers. But then you have to get a little more deeply into what users care about. And so let's say they start with some very high level query. Yeah, pick a high level query. Let's do this on the uh, fly. Uh, Ford Focus. Like we well, work with a lot of Ford, Ford My old presentations. <laughs> <laughs> something more challenging and I have to riff here, but that's a Ford F-150. Yeah, that, those are, we work with a lot of car dealerships, but. Well, we'll stay with Ford Focus since yeah, you went there, yeah. okay? Um, so there's many different things that users might actually have in mind um, when they type in Ford Focus. You can't just, you know, present them with a web page and say, you know, here's the car, or we'll use right. the truck, Ford F-150, here's the truck. Uh, and then um, uh, say, you know, hit buy now, and they're going to click it, and they're going to buy it, and you're done, and that's all there is to it. There are layers to what they need. And those layers are things, now I'm going to get back to your original question, that go beyond the high volume keyword. The high volume right. keyword is Ford F-150, right? Right. Uh, but there's tons of information that they want and lots of choices that they um, uh, might uh, uh, want to make. Uh, it's things like seat warmers, heated steering wheels, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I don't know, the type of bed in the back of the truck, uh, um, the, the I can think of one. I, I just got a. I, I can think of one. I just got a car, and I have three small kids, so I need three rows. So I need. You know, you I, I looked for an SUV for th with three rows. That was the main thing I needed. Yeah. Right. So, so the the car manufacturers at some level have it easy, and then it's it's not that easy. But they what they need to do is really easy because they just need to spell out and offer all their mm -hmm. options and choices, and let users have some way to pick through that non-trivial to put together, uh, so I don't mean to trivialize it, but yeah. but it's fairly well defined. It's e easy to think through the example of all the options. Now let's take a different conversation. Let's say you're a hospital and you're trying to get someone in for a knee surgery. Okay. okay. Um, so, you know, you're going to present a web page that says knee surgery, you know, sign up here. Um, or is that user going to have tons of questions about how do I need to prep the week before? Like, you know, this thing's like, when do I need to stop taking ibuprofen? Because you got to, you know, want to take that like the day before a surgery, typically. Uh, or, you know, or when do I need to stop eating and drinking? Uh, should I take my medications? Um, you know, what should I wear when I go to the surgery, uh, to the hospital? Uh, what are the, the pre-op appointments like? Um, uh, you know, what's recovery like? Uh, how do I know if I'm going to need pain meds? Uh, how do I deal with risk of opioid addiction? Yeah. I could go on for another 10 minutes easily. Right. Right. And a lot of those things are pretty low volume. But if you're going to satisfy the largest percentage of users on the high volume query, it's going to be because you have the answer to the low volume questions. That's, that's, that's outstanding. Yeah, very good. And I'll, I'll make sure I link to the the video with you and Mark in it. So Mark has some great commentary on in there as well about uh, micro intentions and just really great to see you two back together. And then um, an awesome topic as well. Yeah, uh, the, the reason why I asked Mark to to do that topic with me because I saw uh, the article he wrote on Search Engine Journal on this topic, a, a really good piece of content. Uh, and I liked it and I, I needed an excuse to take something to them again anyway. So, well, awesome. I, I wonder if I could, if I could bug you about one more of these, these videos you did, you, you talked about why it's important to study the past in digital marketing. Why our past is I've been doing this since 2007. So I'm, I've been there a little bit. You have been doing this for 30 years. How does somebody work in digital marketing for 30 years? How is that even possible? Well, um, yeah, it's, it's an unusual claim, right? Because you're going to say, wait a minute, do we even have the internet? And 
Yeah, the, the reality is we did. Um, how I got started is I began working with, uh, uh, at, first of all, at the time, I was working for a company called Phoenix Technologies. Um, okay. They were the company that, that are the company that makes the BIOS, which is the first software that, that boots the, the CPU and the motherboard in the great majority of the world's computers. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, fun fact, uh, I was the person who ran the worldwide engineering department for Phoenix Technologies. No kidding. Uh, okay. During the heyday of the PC revolution. So the internet revolution is my second um, where I've been um, fairly uh, involved in one respect or another. But anyway, um, how I got started in digital marketing is we actually had a deal with a company called Quantum Computing Services, which was the original name for a service called America Online, uh, which in the early 90s what became the world's number one ISP, if you will. And uh, it was my group. Uh, that uh, had a small sales team that went out and uh, 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 signed deals with major PC manufacturers to bundle America Online uh, in there and get them the subscribers that helped drive them to that number one position. So, uh, so that was literally digital marketing way, way back in the day. Yeah, like the early 90s, I would imagine. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Well, you've had a more interesting career than I even knew. That's wild. So... <laughs> Um, well, what are the things that you mentioned in the, in the video is, you know, if you've been in, in SEO for any period of time, you know, about the spammy days of, of, uh, the recent past. And so a lot of this has gotten cleaned up. Uh, the most obvious things like hidden text, white text on a white background were cleaned up even probably before I got started. Um, right. then we went through a, a period of Panda and Penguin, these huge, these huge, uh, algorithm changes to target spam. I think it was really interesting a point you made about what we can learn about that spammy past as it relates to doing our job today. Um, do, do you do you feel like you can you can share that with our audience? Sure. Um, so um, from my perspective, it's uh, what we saw is a lot of short term thinking, right? Yeah. A big focus on short term thinking. Um, uh, and so that spammy behavior, you know, buy links, uh, uh, you know, let's buy links because it works. And, <laughs> um, and, you know, come on, you have a company that was already one of the, the world's largest companies and it's just grown, uh, since then that, um, uh, you know, dominating this market area, um, that, uh, you were at odds with. You were fighting with mm -hmm. Building Forty Three on the Google uh, uh, campus, right? And at the Googleplex, and um, you were going to lose. And it, it, it was just, it was just, was it going to take five years? Was it going to take a decade? You were going to lose. And, yeah. um, and 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 so it's really important to develop that long term thinking where you're focused on where are they trying to go. What are they trying to accomplish? And that relates back to the whole conversation we had about user intent in the beginning. That's where they're headed. And that's yeah, where we you, need to head. You, you say you should, you should surf these macro trends. That's really one of the things from the video. We've talked about some of this already. One of the things that has really fascinated you is AI broadly, but GPT-3 specifically. As it relates to GPT-3, what excites you? What are some use cases today? What are some of the limitations of, of, uh, of GPT-3? Sure. Um, so what excites me uh, to start is the, the scale. So the uh, largest previous model released uh, was the uh, Microsoft Turing NLG with 17 billion parameters um, that it was trained on. GPT-3 was trained on 175 billion. 10x, wow. big leap, uh, yeah. and uh, it, it just enables it to do so much more than prior models. And I'll, I'll get into that in a moment, but I do want to first just address some of the limitations. Um, the, the limitations really, it's trained on the open web. 
So therefore, it's susceptible to uh, you know what it finds in the open web. It's not like the open web is the perfect arbiter of truth. Uh, so um, I've seen examples out there where um, you know somebody asked GPT three to produce content around the uh, uh, the Jewish uh, people, and it came back mm-hmm. talking about being banks and and thieves, and, and it was very objectionable yeah. content. Right. Um, and, and because there, there's no bias filter there. And right. the, the other issue with GPT-3, before I get to the fact that there are things you can do with it, um, um, is that it has no model for the real world and doesn't have judgment around these kinds of questions right, or issues. And, and even if you start trying to think about how would we apply that judgment, you got to ask, who would that judgment come from? Here, I'll, I'll do it. All you need to do is have everyone on planet Earth agree that I'm the perfect arbiter of truth. Probably not going to happen, right? So, so that's the, the limitation. But having said that, there's some things it already does remarkably well. So imagine um, that you have uh, large quantities of uh, content that you need to review. Um, and you want, uh, let's just say you have a thousand articles you need to review. And it's like, you need to find some place to start. Um, You could create a GPT-3 algorithm uh, to uh, summarize those for you. And actually simplify your task of engaging in the process. So rather than approaching the mass randomly, you would get a really easy summarization. You might even, with some editing, uh, simple editing, be able to use those as uh, teaser intros to that content. Sure. Um, mm-hmm. Which uh, which you could publish, and you could actually speed your uh, creation process. Um, I'm a little leery of creating entire content pieces without additional training, but yeah. with additional training, you can actually tune GPT-3 to get a lot closer so it needs less editing and maybe even use it in content creation. I wouldn't do it, excuse the, the way of phrasing, but I think you know what I mean. I wouldn't do it naked, you know, just have yeah. it, uh, create it and throw it out there and hope for the best. Uh, I do know what I mean, yeah. But, um, and then uh, if you have an e-commerce site with a million pages, you probably have a, a kind of crude algorithm uh to generate meta descriptions for all those pages. Um, uh, and it's, it's probably iffy at best. Uh, you could use GPT-3 with some training on your site. That's smart. To get yeah. much more optimized to scale meta description creation um, no, that's, tool. That's so a great idea. You gotta find the right uses to get around the weaknesses. No, I think that that's really comprehensive. So uh, very interesting. Again, you're putting out so many great pieces of content you have your your com- you and your company are involved in so many different things it's it's i hope i can get to all of these one of the ones one of the things that it's become sort of an annual tradition now is that you'll do an analysis of how important links are to seo and so it sort of every uh, maybe you can you can fill in the blanks here if i don't know but every year since 2016 you've you've done this sort of analysis in partnership with Moz and how close that partnership is i'm not exactly sure one of the things that uh, is interesting is, surprise, surprise, links do correlate to better rankings, but there's a, this really big caveat about the, the quality of the links. What if In the TLDR version of the study, which is posted on Moz and on the Proficient website in long form, in the TLDR version, what did you learn about links this year when you guys were studying them? So I, I think the, the big thing is... Um, if you use the quantity of links pointing to a web page as a ranking factor, and you evaluate how well that correlates, that number has been slowly but steadily declining over time. Mm. When you apply an authority metric, and because we, uh, Moz was gracious enough to give us access to their data, we used uh, uh, Moz's uh, domain authority and uh, page authority metrics. Um, so, um, we, uh, we see that the correlation based on the authority of the links pointing to your pages is going up over time. Mm. 
So it appears to me that um, that Google is moving in a direction where they are turning up the dial. They're probably getting better at, at defining what authority really is. Um, now, just so uh, I, I don't want to appear biased in, in this data, I, I would expect that if we use the AHREF metrics right. or the uh, Majestic metrics or right. the SEMrush metrics, that we would probably get similar correlations. I think the key thing here is the importance of authority is going up. Yeah, it makes it makes perfect sense uh, in, in our experience as well. Is the plan to continue doing this this survey and this study for the for foreseeable future? It's it's something that I touched on in my question, but it's it's something you've been doing now for almost five years, I believe. Um, yeah. Do, 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 um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, we we've got the process down. <laughs> yeah. Cool. We we. We know how to do it, and uh, I think it brings uh, uh, value, uh, you know, to the community. Just keep reminding ourselves, um, if I can, I just want to take one second and try to make it really clear why it is they will continue the matter for uh, a period of time. Please. Yeah. Um, uh, imagine that I come to you, Mark, and say, "Hey, uh, can you link to my site?" Um, your your initial reaction is going to be, well, what's in it for me? Right. And, you know, obviously we're not supposed to pay for the links. And, right. um, and while that marketplace is still out there, it's obviously been greatly diminished by Google actions. Mm -hmm. And very almost no major brand that I know of uh, does anything like that these days. But, um, but if I ask you for this link, your perspective, forget, you know, the what's in it for you question, your perspective. Perspective starts with, well, if I put a link on my site, I'm asking someone who I've fought hard to get to my site to leave it. Mm. Why would I do that? Right. Why would I ask someone to leave my site? It's like a battle to grow my traffic and try, try to increase conversions. Why am I asking someone to leave? And, right. you know, assuming that you play the game totally fair, which is, you know, the, the way we do, of course, um, the only possible reason is by linking to someone, I'm enhancing my relationship with the person who might click through and go to that site. Yeah. That's the benefit for me. So wait a minute. I would only do that if it was valuable enough that it enhanced the relationship with that person. Therefore, I am actually endorsing it. See what I'm saying? So that's, that's a great, great perspective, yeah. This is the critical psychology behind links, and it doesn't exist in social media. It's not the same. Um, I mean, there's an element of it, but there's there's no downside for me to send someone away from my social media post. Uh, I, I don't right. have anything to lose, and none of yeah. that. Yeah. The most popular things, you know, grumpy cat, you know, or stuff like that. But, you know, it's, it's like it, it's just it's. It's a whim. It's a goof, you know. And, uh, in, right. It's not the same. I I think that's a great. I think that's a great perspective. And to use your word, psychology. That's the psychology around it. I think it's that's perfectly said, uh, Eric. I, I do want to touch on one more thing, and then uh, we'll wrap up. But the last thing is this SEMrush course that you guys that you have put together. It's like content marketing and SEO fundamentals. Uh, as usual, SEMrush has done a great job putting these things together. Um, who is who is the target audience for this, as far as you're concerned? Is this for marketers? Is it for people who are just getting started uh, in, in writing and in content work? Um, who should be following this course? So, um, yeah, it, the design of it really is, is, is for marketers with, that, in this case, are focusing their content efforts around SEO. Um, uh, and, you know, it's definitely not a deep dive on tech SEO, for example, right? right. So um, it's, it's more about how do you create that uh, uh, content in a way that brings traffic to your site and, um, and you know, drives visibility and, frankly, informational content when you're doing that part of it uh, helps create brand loyalty. And, mm. um, uh, and the propensity for conversion. So uh, it is more towards that uh, that type of audience. Well, awesome. We'll, we'll link to as many of these things in the show notes as I as I possibly can remember. Uh, it's it's very well done. 
And I've, you know, I've been following your career for as long as I've been going to conferences. I think the first time I heard you speak was in 11 or 12, something like that. So this is like they say in the radio, first time, long time. I've been a first time talking to you, but a long time fan. And I, well, I wanted to uh, just, just thank you for all this sort of work. I think it really does help young young SEOs who are just trying to get better and do their best uh, to have access to these kinds of things. So I want to make sure everybody, if you're if you're a young SEO just getting started, make sure to go to the SEM, to the SEMrush. I'm still getting used to this. SEMrush uh, course with Eric Enga and, and take a look. All right, I'm going to wrap up. These are, uh, this is everybody's favorite part of the show, Eric. This is where Greg Gifford gives me a question to ask the guests, but he gives me no context. So neither me or you don't really know what's going on here. So it's a bit of a high wire act and uh, it's usually pretty fun. So for you, he has two words for, he has, he has actually two questions. The first one, wine tennis. Do you know what this means? Wine tennis. So wine tennis. So wine tennis means uh, having great fun uh, with wine dinners, with great friends at conferences, uh, Steve Hammer and I uh, are the uh, the ones who play the wine tennis and ping pong back and forth, picking uh, uh, expensive bottles of wine uh, so that we can all get a taste of something unique and different. And I so, so miss it. Uh, <laughs> I, I can't wait uh, until we get out to be on the uh, um, circuit again and get to have one of those. I already war warned Mr. Gifford. That it's going to be an expensive one. <laughs> well, I'd love I'd love a seat at the table too if you can fit me in. So, um, uh, all right, last last out of out of context question or no context question. He said to ask you about foosball. Is there anything about foosball that you could share with us? Sure. Uh, so um, that's just back into my history when I was uh, growing up. Uh, uh, you know, college and, and shortly after completing college, um, I started playing foosball, sometimes called table soccer. You know, it's mm -hmm. that game in the bars, uh, uh, you know, big, hefty wooden box with kind of steel rods that you're pulling back and forth and shooting balls in the, uh, in the goal. Uh, um, so um, the, the fun fact is that uh, I was 1984 world champion. Nope. Uh, I was 1985 U.S. national champion, um, and uh, I don't play that much anymore. Um, well, pretty much never. Um, I do still have a foosball table in the basement of uh, my house, which is the current tour table. Um, mm -hmm. And as I like to tell people when I share this tidbit with them, um, if um, we're ever out, you know, bar hopping at night and you want to win a bar bet, I'm still your guy. <laughs> I love it. And if you, if you find your way to Chicago, uh, in our office in Chicago, we have a foosball table. So you could, you know, start, start taking money from our employees, I guess. That'd be, that'd be fun for me to watch. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, you might know. need to raise another round or something. To <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, perfect. Well, Eric, I, I really appreciate you coming on. This was, I feel like I, I, uh, I could have kept talking for another hour, so maybe we'll have to do this again sometime. Um, I did. I knew about your your love for wine, so that was interesting to hear about the tennis. So this is the first time on Suds and Search I've ever had a glass of wine. Um, so I guess that's that's where I'll leave it. I'll, I'll give you a virtual cheers. Until next time, uh, thanks for coming on, and we'll be back next week with Suds and Search. Sounds great. Thanks for having me on, Mark. Appreciate it. All right. Bye now.